Ronaldo Nehemiah, really great to be able to chat with you here at Eugene, Oregon. Um, so first thing I want to ask you is your nickname, Skeets. Um, can you talk to me about where you got that nickname and how it kind of stuck throughout your entire career? It's interesting you asked the question. It was asked today on the golf course. And uh, uh, if you're familiar with uh, skeet shooting at a, a rifle range, uh, when I was an infant, when I crawled, I crawled really fast across the floor. Uh, and it, re it reminded folks of a, a skeet going really fast. And they say, pulled, and the skeet goes. And they used to say, I skeeted about. And my, my family calls me Skeetsy. Uh, and then as I got a little older, it was Skeets. So that's the reference. I was always quick, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. And I, I think a lot, of, a lot of younger people, you know, they don't know that, which is a pretty interesting story. Um, and so going into your career a little bit, you know, of course you went to, uh, to Maryland. And 1979 was like a huge, huge year for you. That was like a really big breakout year and a legendary year in terms of the sport. Uh, can you talk about that year a little bit and in the sense of did you expect to have so much success with breaking the world record and winning Pan Ams and all these accomplishments you had that year? Well I had broken 13 in high school mm -hmm. so I, I had the confidence going into my freshman year at University of Maryland that uh, I would have some level of success. Um, obviously being impatient you want, want it sooner than later. Fortunately for me I think it was my third race of the indoor season I broke the world indoor record so um, I had started on my way and then 1979 I broke the world record outdoors twice 13 16 and 13 flat um, I was always always a, a well-rounded athlete but in 79 at the Penn relays the world or the, the eastern part of the United States got a chance to really see that I wasn't a one-dimensional athlete running the 4x1, 4x2, shuttle hurdles, and then, of course, the 4x4. Four four. And I got a chance to show everybody, uh, not that I was only a world-rounded athlete, but the reason why I was so dominant in the hurdles. I had so much strength and I had speed. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. And <clears throat> so going through there and moving, moving forward, right, you, during that time, the sport was amateur at the time, and then it, of course, transitioned into uh, professional. And there's kind of the the Nehemiah rule, right? That's like what you kind of got coined of for that transition into football. Um, can you talk to me about that transition of the sport from amateur to professional and what your thoughts are on our sport now as a professional sport over the past, you know, almost 50 years at this point? It's, in, it's very interesting to transition from amateur to, to professional. Uh, I'm biased, but I still think the sport was more popular when it was an amateur sport. During my day, I think so many athletes like myself ran for the love of the sport. Uh, it meant so much to us. Not saying that the athletes of today don't, but many of the athletes today don't understand the rich history. Uh, the sport was not always professional. They were born into it, so I don't hold that against them, but they need to know the history, the rich history, and especially in their events, to understand that it wasn't always like this. Certain individuals had to pave the way, had to have certain sacrifices. Case in point, Devin Allen just signed with the Philadelphia Eagles, and I spoke to him about three, four weeks ago, and I asked him, did he understand the significance of what he's doing when they talk about the comparison to he and I, meaning I play with the San Francisco 49ers. He was unaware, and I said, Devin, the day I signed with the 49ers, I was banned for four and a half years. The day you signed with the Eagles, the next week you were running. I said, there's a rule called the Nehemiah rule, which allowed all collegiate athletes to now be a, a collegiate in one event and a professional in the other. And he said he never knew that. And I said, I was alarmed because I thought that was the only parallel that made sense why they would compare him to me. Mm -hmm. But at that point, he says, well, I need to go read about that. I go, you should. You need to understand your history. What you're doing today was not always permissible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why did you choose to leave track and field and go into the sport of football? The only reason I left, well, there were two reasons. One, the 1980 boycott yeah. really hurt me tremendously. I had trained for the utopia of the sport, which are the Olympic Games, yeah. only to have politics come into play and take that away from me. And in the aftermath of the United States boycott in the, the Moscow Olympics, the Eastern Bloc countries, in retaliation, were, getting, were talking of boycotting the 84 Olympics and I just didn't know the ramifications at that point another four more years what that would look like and I was graduating Maryland in 1981 
college senior would need a job soon thereafter, and as God would have it, uh, met Dwight Clark, Superstars competition, one thing led to another, and I'm getting a call from Bill Walsh. So the 49ers saved my athletic career because all I was doing was running for medals. Yeah. There was no money permissible in the sport. So I got to be paid and compensated for my athletic prowess, um, but I would have never left the sport had we not boycotted the yeah, first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was the impetus of me just, um, just not feeling really good in my pit about something that I love so dearly that I never would have control over it. And I just said, okay, well, if you're going to take that away from me, then do I have another avenue? And I was just fortunate and blessed to have talent enough to be able to pursue something else at the time. Yeah. And I'm curious because um, did you know the rule? Because you talk about your love for the sport and, you know, your passion for the sport, but it was um, almost a financial decision, right, to um, to move to the to football. But did you know what the rule was about amateurism versus professionalism and that loss of, you know, four years that you'd have? Well, I fully comprehended it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was misinterpreted or totally ignored by the IAAF at the time. The sport read that your, your professional sport could not age you or give you an advantage as an amateur. So there was no way of me running across the middle or getting my head knocked off was going to make me a better hurdler. Uh, but the, I was a huge name at the time, and the IAAF president, Primo Nibiolo, took it personally that I was shunning my sport to do something different. And so he personally made sure that I wasn't going to be allowed to run. I mean, I went through all of the judicial systems. I won at every level, mm -hmm. at every single level, and he would just impose a threat that if Nehemiah ran against anyone, any athlete who was in the race was contaminated. So Meech weren't willing to expose other athletes by calling his bluff. So four and a half years, I fought him in court, and it just came down to what will it take for you to go away? If you drop your lawsuits, we'll let you back in. And I said, you could have done that four and a half years ago. So, and that's what happened. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, yeah, like you said, you've kind of paved the way and like established, a, you know, a precedent for so many athletes now. I mean, the things they're able to do. Um, but then just diving into hurdles a little bit, you know, of course, you um, broke the world record multiple times. First person under 13 seconds in the hurdles. Um, but you were also one of the top sprinters or a top sprinter, right? You in the 400, the 100. And I think I've seen you. I think I've read a quote where you said if you had the chance if you didn't go to football you could have done like Harrison Dillard did where you know he won 100 100 meter Olympic gold 110 meter um, gold but I'm curious like why don't we see that more often where a lot of hurdlers you know they're not as good of kind of flat sprinters you have seen like Alan Johnson he's really good Grant Holloway is really good but you know um, you know maybe Aries Merritt right he doesn't he doesn't translate as well on the flat or you know things like that I think to answer the question specifically my the the, the event that the event that parallels or goes well with the 110s is the 200 meters. Mm. And uh, in looking back, I said I should have run more two fours because ultimately I was a good 400 meter runner. Yeah. I just didn't want to endure the, <laughs> the agony of running the 400. Yeah. Um, I was a decent 100 meter sprinter, but I was I was more of a speed endurance type guy. So that's where the two and the four comes. Yeah. Um, and then historically, hurdlers don't have to be that fast to run very fast. So if you run 10.5 or a little bit faster than 10.5, you could run 13.0 mm -hmm. because it's a technical event. Because it's only 10 yards between the hurdles, you just have to be efficient in the 10 yards. Yeah. Um, most of us have too much speed for the event. Yeah. Uh, I had too much speed, but I knew how to control my speed. I had very good body control. And there are a lot of guys who have more speed but can't control their body. There are so many guys right now, as you saw here, the winning time in the the, um, the world championship is 13.04. So even though certain people in the race have run under 13, 13 seconds is still a barrier yeah. that not many people can do when it matters. And yeah, we see... Uh, we, we don't see as many people being very consistent in the, in the 12 seconds, right? You had... Um, you know, like David Oliver and Aries Merritt and uh, Colin Jackson, but you know, um, you don't see Grant Holloway breaking 13 as consistently. So, like you said, I think that barrier is still huge, huge barrier. What do you what do you think it'll take to kind of get over that hump and maybe make 12.9 a barrier or something like that? 
today's hurdler still has to spend more time learning how to be more of a, an efficient hurdler. Most hurdlers are so obsessed with speed that the obstacle becomes an obstacle yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're not cleanly clearing the hurdles. Uh, the tracks are faster today, the hurdles are lighter today. Mm. That combination, if you're not a good technical hurdler, is a problem. The tracks weren't as fast as they are today for me. The hurdles are much heavier, so you paid a price if you didn't know how to hurdle. Mm. So we spent a lot of time being an efficient hurdler, a very good hurdler, and then the rest was as we the, the world got to see. So there are many guys out there that should be running under 13 every day, all day but they spend more time trying to be fast than they are trying to be efficient. Yeah. And then um, just to kind of close out with two other questions, um, you mentioned kind of about the exposure of the sport a little bit, um, you know, transitioning into um, professionalism. And in that time, like the, you know, early 80s, mid 80s, and into the early 90s, the sport was kind of massive. Like you had Carl Lewis's and Jackie Joyner Kersey's and these massive, massive names. Um, but since then, I'm not sure if, um, at least from the, a lot of people's perspective, maybe the sport isn't as large or as marketed as it is now. I'm curious on your experience as an athlete who competed during the late 70s and into the professional time in the 80s, and then also as an agent now, what do you think of the exposure of the sport and ways or you know, something that we can do to be able to get the sport much bigger? The sport lives and dies from competition. The 70s and 80s, we had matchups and battles, domestic and international, uh, day in, day out, week in, week out. I ran Foster so many times I couldn't tell you. If he if he were to win, I, I couldn't wait till the next time I ran him, and vice versa. Uh, years since then, everyone wants to protect their rankings, and and rankings bring uh, enhanced prize money. Uh, since we didn't have money. It was pride, it was nationalistic patriotism. And so there's a difference. Uh, there was a unity amongst the athletes, whether it was uh, Carl Lewis, Jackie Joyner, Kersey, we were Americans representing our country. And that pride uh, pro far outweighed any amount of money that we didn't even know of at the time. Today, people wanna make as much money as they can, yet they don't compete against each other with consistency. Yeah. And so the fans don't get, the fans get robbed of the natural competition. What you see here at the World Championships is a natural competitive competition. And you're seeing the best of the best and incredible performances. Well, we should be able to see that more than just once or twice a year. Um, and that therein lies, to me, the challenge that the world wants to see the best compete at their best, not just once or twice a year, uh, because it's hard to have substantial fan following when they don't get to know the athletes. Yeah. You know, they run so infrequently. Um, there are household. There are certain people who, who whose personalities jump off the page or yeah. whose household names jump off the page. Uh, my name has lasted for so many decades. It's different, number one. But I won. Yeah. And I won often, and I took on any and everybody. So. You have a name that's different that everybody remembers, but they also remember the epic battles. We don't have a lot of epic battles since those days. Do you think things like the the Diamond League circuit that we have? Well, you know, we only have Prefontaine here in the U.S. at least, but you know, the Diamond League circuit, and you know, we have like um, you know American Track League, and you know, we have more meets popping up. Do you think that's good or bad in the sense of creating that competition for athletes? Well, we have different levels and different tiers. The Diamond League is the highest of the highest, and that's by invitation. They're all invitation, yeah. but the top rank get invited to the Diamond League, but you still don't always have the matchups yeah. in the Diamond Leagues. I think because we have such an influx of athletes, both domestic and internationally, uh, we need meets to give people opportunities. We don't have a G League or a Triple A League. Um, it's just unfortunate that um, everyone who graduates college or who has fulfilled their college eligibility is not a professional athlete mm -hmm. but unfortunately sometimes they think because their eligibility is up now they're a pro pro comes by way of invitation yeah. by way of performance and and we don't have a, a training grooming ground all the time for that we have the lower tiers but that can become financially burdening 
because they don't pay out as much, so it's, you have to come out of pocket to, to go on those tours. But um, I'm just hoping that you know we we just find more opportunities domestically and quality, not just to have a meet, but have uh, Americans who want to spend some more time at home competing so that we can really build this up and people just don't wait for every four years to think that track and field matters. So last question, um, again, you know, you competed and you've spoken about your love for the sport when you're competing um, and even when you did go to football, you still love the sport, but now as an agent, you're on a different side of it, but what do you, what do you love about the sport? So what keeps you going? Well, I work with a lot of young people, so part of that mentoring and developing and help and watching someone who comes in so green and hopefully fall in love with the sport, you know, they, they're in like with the sport right now, and we just hope through my tutelage I can, uh, I guess, convey to them the passion that I have, and, and they can start to, to see the passion, because if you love it, you can have a career. If you don't love it, it's, it's temporary, um, and so I... My thing is just trying to, I try to teach people what it is to be a professional. Uh, yes, this is entertainment, but this is your job. Yeah. And you have to take it seriously. In every competition, someone is trying to move you out of your job. And so it's your, your goal and objective is to be your very best and take losing personally. You know, not, not for it to make you depressed or anything, but not to get comfortable with that, yeah. that loss and say, okay, that's uncomfortable, I don't like that, I need to do something about that. And then, and then be real and honest and look in that mirror and say, what can I or what have I done to prepare myself to be my very best? If you're running your very best and you lose, that happens. Somebody just had a better day. But most times when people lose, it's because they've cut corners or certain things they could have done, they're distracted, there are other things that are prioritizing in their life, and it, and it comes full circle at the wrong time on display when it matters most. So, but by and large, I think every youngster out here, young person out here who's running, I believe has a dream. Um, and I just hope that they do everything they can to fulfill that dream or to get as close to fulfilling it as possible. That's nice. And just real quick, of course, you know, once in hurdles, all that, but what's like your favorite event outside of the hurdles that you love to watch? That's, that's a loaded question. Um, so it probably, it probably well, it's the 200 and the 400 because both of them require execution. Mm. You know, uh, there's like two, three different uh, target points in the 200. Yeah. There's four, there's four par target points in the 400, mm -hmm. and every person runs them differently. But if you execute it to perfection, it's a thing of beauty, and you can see it happening. Mm. I can see it happening, and it reminds me of my hurdling technique and what I needed to do and what points I need to hit and what positions I needed to be at. Uh, and I focus more on that than I did so much, the, not so much the competition, yeah. you know, because if I ran like I practiced, I knew I would have success. And that's, that's the great thing is if you can come in here and you're prepared because your practice indicates that you're ready, then add adrenaline to it and you know, you see a Sydney McLaughlin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I love it. Do you, do you have a prediction? I mean, we got the 200 meters tonight, The men, well, both the men's and the women's. Do you have a prediction for, for them? Fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, fast. I think the women, obviously, 21-5, maybe better. Mm. Uh, possibility, depending on the wind conditions. Uh, I think it's going to be a dogfight between Noah Lyles and Arian Knight. Uh, there's some revenge factor for Arian Knight, who lost yeah. at pre Fontaine uh, at the Nationals. Yeah, yep. So, um, but again, it's it's that's what competition is about. That's yeah. what you want to see. We've seen that thus far in most multiple events here, field events included. So, um, I just want us to continue to do that more often than just now. Yeah. Ronaldo Nehemiah, thank you so much. All it's right. amazing to learn so much about your history and your perspective on the sport now and the things you're doing. So really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for that.